Good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is Anders Åslund. I'm a senior fellow here at the Eurasia uh, Center at the Atlantic uh, Council. And it's my great uh, pleasure uh, today to introduce our guest, uh, Yevhen Hlybovitsky, who's a leading Ukrainian in intellectual. He's uh, uh, connected both to uh, the Kiev Mohila Academy in Kiev and uh, to the uh, <coughs> Catholic University in, in Lviv, and he is uh, uh, founder of uh, Promova uh, think tank and uh, consulting uh, company. And uh, the uh, specific uh, interest of uh, Yevhen is not only that he thinks in big terms about uh, Ukraine, but he also tries to think differently about uh, Ukraine. And the title here was uh, Melinda Herring that put up for the event today, Everything You Know About uh, Ukraine Is Wrong. And uh, uh, what we thought we should have here today is simply a broad discussion about, um, about uh, uh, Ukraine. So please, the floor is yours, Jevhen. Thank you so much. <coughs> um, I was afraid that uh, um, the title is a little pretentious, but I was told that this fits the um, market economy influence upon uh, democratic institutions and uh, intellectual life uh, in a free world. So uh, I uh, was also told that it's a hint not to be boring. Uh, mm -hmm. So I will do uh, my best to try to uh, tell you things that uh, are not boring and that you probably uh, do not know. I tried to uh, work hard uh, in uh, my professional life not to read the news, uh, uh, because one of the things that happens in my field of study is the news create buzz that uh, basically works as a smoke screen. You can't see through that. There are many things that are happening that are important, but that are not bright enough to make it to the front pages. And uh, I want to talk about some of these important things uh, today, and I want to see what's uh, beneath the radar uh, that we should be paying attention to uh, in the case of Ukraine. Um, I was asked to bring in some cases. So let me bring three cases um, from different parts of Ukraine that are important and that are not reported. I'll start with uh, Ivano-Frankivsk. Ivano-Frankivsk is a uh, small city of about 250,000 in west of Ukraine. Um, and this is a place where um, uh, some people took initiative that was quite different from what we usually see. We, we are uh, very often conducting discussions about business or about nonprofit uh, sector, but we are kind of tending to separate it one from another. And this is exactly the case when things merged. 100 people, mostly business owners, threw in $1,000 each, they got 100K, and they invested that into a restaurant. Not because there is not enough restaurants in, uh, in the city, but because then the structure of ownership would allow that restaurant to become a meeting place for very different uh, people with very different agendas. Basically making sure that there isn't a voice that is shut out in the city. 80% of the profits of uh, that restaurant go as grants for local initiatives. And uh, when we finally learned how much that is in money, that was about the amount that all other donors were bringing to the city. And uh, this is a rare case how a small initiative by 100 people can turn into something much bigger. This is the place. This is how lively it is. This is uh, how uh, it uh, uh, basically lives on an everyday basis. Uh, this is me talking at 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, almost four years ago uh, there, uh, when they had US elections night. If someone told you that you can have 100 people in the facility that only seats about 80, in four o'clock in the morning in Ivano Frankivsk, and no one's paying these people? Well, that, that was the case, you know. People were watching uh, the live uh, from uh, the United States, live, live uh, 
coverage and they were discussing and they had panels with the future minister of economy uh, or at that time i'm sorry he was already former minister of economy and and, and <laughs> it some, moved fast yeah it was fast <laughs> yeah and and some and some uh, other respected uh, uh, experts um this uh, for many people came out of uh, nowhere because uh, there wasn't um, a model before and what was important that um uh, urban space has created a new model, and then that model went on as a franchise to Kyiv. Now it's going further to Mariupol, and it's expanding further and further and further. 500 people in Kyiv put $1,000 each, me included, created a restaurant downtown Kyiv, which now hosts uh, uh, multiple events and is an important meeting place that basically multiplies the social capital that exists um, in town. Then. Uh, Further, uh, this initiative developed into something much bigger. These are the remains of the old factory, um, downtown Ivano-Frankivsk, uh, with about two acres of land, uh, two hectares, I'm, so I'm sorry, of land, uh, right uh, downtown Ivano-Frankivsk. Can't get more downtown than this. And uh, the same uh, organization that created this restaurant uh, thought that it would be interesting to buy out this old plant, and transform it not into commercial prep property, but into a set of public spaces with some commercial activity in them as well. And uh, this is how the plant looked. This is how it looked from the inside. This is what it was. It used to do gas meters. Uh, they were exported to 60, during Soviet time, they were exported to 60 countries of the world, uh, including Cuba. Um, and uh, this is the render of uh, what it should look like. And uh, one of the floors is already uh, renovated and it's extreme, it's, it's incredibly lively and uh, uh, it's hosting NGOs, it's hosting uh, uh, different initiatives, it's hosting artists, etc. The important thing is that um, to collect $5 million to um, buy out this property, it was probably one of the biggest fundraising efforts ever in Ukraine. Uh, the, um, initi the, the people who started the initiative made sure that they're not like, taking toxic money, made sure that they're not taking money from the oligarchs, and uh, as a result, they basically were taking these money in very small contributions, um, uh, and as a result, uh, Collecting five million dollars this way was quite an effort. This this shows the capacity, the growing capacity of Ukraine. Uh, you know, it's developing new models, it's coming up with new ideas, it's coming up with um, uh, new senses. Another uh, thing, which I think is uh, also uh, under the radars, is the religious landscape in Ukraine, which is very important. Uh, we have three religious leaders from the. Um, uh, two major Christian denominations and um, uh, a Jewish religious leader in one picture, which is a very common thing. When I was Googling for this picture, there are tons of them in different settings. You know, you can have one with a dark background, you can have one with a light background, you can have, there's, there's a number of them. The important thing is that all of them are stressing uh, something that goes beyond the spiritual life. Uh, they're talking about importance of democracy. They're talking about importance of accountability of the government. They're talking about issues that allow <coughs> Ukrainians to, to change their culture, to, for instance, uh, pay more attention to being result-oriented or be becoming more productive. This way in impacting many areas of life, um, uh, including uh, those that, for instance, define the productivity of economy. Um, uh, almost all major Ukrainian churches were talking in the last year how important it is to, sa to save energy, uh, which is a big political thing, but at the same time it's also a lifetime, uh, lifestyle thing for, for many Ukrainian households who have been brought up in a culture where energy saving is not one of the treats that, that um, uh, people were living with. Uh, the church is an important player. It has the highest, it's out of all institutions in Ukrainian society, it has the highest um, level of institutional trust. Therefore, it has incredible ability to set things onto, onto agenda. 
the church is able to influence agenda very much. And having the church as a productive player in Ukraine's transformation is extremely important because the church is one of the very few players that can actually talk to society about things that are unpleasant and bring bad news to the table in a way that is taken as constructive criticism, not in a way that is taken as um, a uh, cause for the fight. And this is the third um, case that I want to bring. This is the picture from Donbass. This is a famous picture because it depicts a building in Avdiivka that is mostly abandoned. Some people still live there, but it's mostly abandoned. It's been shelled. And um, one of the uh, European artists um, came to Donbass and uh, saw the picture of one of the residents of this building and decided to turn that picture into a mural. This is a living person. This is a school teacher, local school teacher, who actually lived in that building. But when you look at an apartment building like that, um, you pretty much understand that it can come from any Soviet city. The entire former Soviet Union is full of buildings like that. And the question, how do you transform Soviet life into a livable life is probably one of the most difficult questions we have uh, in uh, the entire former Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, here's a um, picture of Hope uh, from about uh, 30 miles away from where the previous picture was. I'm sorry. I was told not to push that button. Um, <laughs> and again. <laughs> OK, let me put it here. And <laughs> OK. This is, um, <laughs> OK, you, we have it here as well. Uh, it's the same picture. This is a fountain um, in Kramatorsk. Kramatorsk is an industrial city uh, in uh, Donbass. And it's uh, one of the cities uh, that reflect the economic um, uh, model that Soviets built there. Basically, what you <coughs> have is you have a huge plant. And then you have many barrack-style apartment buildings where people lived. And there is no other life but work and sleep. That's it. And um, uh, the city of Kramatorsk has uh, brought this fountain. And it's uh, quite fashionable and popular now in, in many European cities to have fountain where water uh, streams uh, from, from the ground uh, so it doesn't have a basin, but it just goes uh, from the ground itself. Instantly, on the central square, uh, which used to be deserted, every day you have hundreds of people. For the first time in many years, hundreds of people spend time together and talk to each other. In Christian terms, I call it a miracle. And um, Basically, this is the beginning of the transformation that further blossoms with greater entrepreneurship, greater private initiative, greater pluralism, uh, greater um, openness to, to, to um, diversity. So basically, what we're talking about, we're talking about cases that are showing how life is becoming more, more diverse. Uh, we're talking about new scales. We're talking about people who can help themselves. And uh, we're talking about, at the same time, innovations in terms of models. But at the same time, we're also talking about um, uh, achieving new standards of um, uh, social life, achieving new standards of uh, uh, self-governance that weren't there before. So this is the, sh the short introduction that I was told that I can do. And then I was told that I will be, I will be thrown questions at. So. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I thought that I should moderate the discussion for 40 minutes or so and then uh, open up uh, the floor at about 4.30 for uh, uh, questions. So let me start here. What you are providing us uh, with, Jevhen, is a contrast to this idea of messy transformation, uh, co corruption, and war with Russia. And instead, you're offering entrepreneurship, uh, a lively uh, a local um, uh, initiative, uh, and also uh, churches that are contributing to civil society. So how strong is this? Would you argue that uh, Ukraine has uh, become a uh, sustainable uh, uh, d democracy uh, t uh, today? Or, or, uh, and how European has uh, Ukraine become? in its uh, value, does this hold? 
Okay, that's about, we're going to finish about tomorrow morning with we'll see if I, <laughs> if I thoroughly go into every, every, every aspect of this. First is, um, <clears throat> I'm not trying to be over-optimistic. Uh, many of the issues that you've mentioned are real. You know, we shouldn't close our eyes and say there is no corruption or, you know, the, the war with Russia doesn't exist. These things are very real. They are daily challenges. We live with them every day. What I'm saying is that life is not limited to these factors, and there are other factors that are as important or even more important that we should be uh, taking a balanced view. The view of Ukraine has been uh, uh, quite special. You know, I was uh, asked at uh, Dallas Airport upon arrival where I'm from by a gentleman, and I said, from Ukraine, and he was like, oh. You know. <laughs> uh, and, uh, 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 the good thing is, by the way, that I no longer have to explain where the hell Ukraine is. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, uh, that's, that's a good thing in about, uh, after about 30 years, at least, that I remember. Uh, but um, uh, to make democracy sustainable, uh, it's a long path. And uh, Ukraine has some good starting positions because it's a very diverse country. <coughs> uh, if you are in any groups, of Ukrainian society, then one or the other way you are in minority. So in that sense, uh, there's acute understanding that a winner takes all is not a good formula for Ukraine's existence. Now, if you want to ask about sustainability of democracy, uh, then it's a tricky question because you can't have sustainability of democracy if you don't have security. Uh, what lack of security means it means that every actor that is out there plays zero sum, zero sum game against all other actors. What presence of security means is that you are capable of playing a win-win, capable of playing positive sum game. Security is exactly something that Ukraine doesn't get. And that's a very good thing to say that, well, you know, isn't that Ukrainians' uh, task to make themselves more secure. <laughs> yes, but in the modern world, we do not know a example where this would have done from the inside successfully. Uh, if we look at the European countries, uh, Europe the European countries have received an incredible loan um, right after the Second World War, not with money, but with security from the United States through NATO. If we look at the Asian tigers, you know, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, these, country are, these countries are democracies. These countries are democracies because they have put trust in being protected by the United States in the uh, U.S. presence in the region. And, you know, we can, we can, we can continue with uh, Hong Kong, maybe uh, Singapore, uh, that those are, you know, city-states. They don't have resources to protect themselves against, for instance. China. So <clears throat> if, we're talking, if we're talking about a sustainability of democracy, Ukraine has to fix its security problem. And fixing security problem basically means that uh, there should be an effort from inside, in, inside Ukraine, from the inside, but there also, it should also be complemented by assistance from the outside. And uh, this outside assistance, let me be frank, is lagging behind. Ukraine doesn't have the assurances of the kind that it needs. Uh, the uh, Budapest Memorandum has turned to be a different type of uh, treaty that many Ukrainians hoped. Uh, the assurances that Ukraine gets from other countries uh, in some cases come too late or uh, in some cases are insufficient. Uh, the important take from the uh, whole situation with the impeachment here is that um, something that Ukraine was very assured of before is now um, questioned. You know, how, how, how steady is the U.S. support for Ukraine? You know, how strong is it? Uh, it's uh, very clear that there is no change in policy, but at the same time the question is, you know, how will, will it work operationally? Um, and uh, it's a good question, and uh, it's, it's a big challenge. Now, when we're speaking about how European Ukraine is, it's uh, if we define European um, through the 
criteria of um, uh, 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 that of values that the European Union has been founded on. I would claim that in many cases, when Ukraine deals with the EU, it's a good question which side is more European. And um, uh, Ukraine obviously lags behind in uh, institutional development. Ukraine obviously is a very weak institution. Ukraine obviously is a country with uh, um, many problems that, you, that it will have to solve before it becomes admissible. But uh, at the same time, it doesn't get a fair play in uh, necessarily. And partially, it's a homework that the EU will have to do, uh, answering the question what kind of union uh, there. Maint. Uh, uh, is this the union of uh, uh, a, a new uh, um, line of uh, political thought between Macron and uh, Orban? Uh, or is this a country where uh, elections actually matter? Uh, it, and, and, and that's going to be that's going to be a tricky thing because uh, you see, not only Ukraine. Uh, so to to respond to the sustainability question because uh, um, uh, I think if anything now is that uh, there is lack of sustainability in general. Yeah, uh, when institutions are weak, then the leaders is all the more important. Uh, an enigmatic uh, new leader, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. And uh, so far, we do not really know uh, where he's taking your country. What, uh, what is your reading of uh, Zelensky? What does he really want? Do what does he really stand uh, for? And what do you expect from him? Well, um, Zelensky has won with a landslide of 72% of the voters. Uh, and the first thing that I would like to say is that in no way I would question the good intentions of the 72% of Ukrainians. So 72% of Ukrainians felt that there is something fundamentally wrong and that they have to correct it. And they voted for Zelensky. If 72% of the people do this, then it means that there is a solid reason behind it. We rarely have figures like that in our demo democratic elections outcome. Uh, actually, if you're talking about uh, 70 plus, it's only the second time. The first time was the referendum on independence in 1991 when we had 90%. Uh, so what I think happened is that the voters felt that something was wrong. And uh, considering that it's a young democracy, they have sent a sing signal that something hurts. Now, uh, how will this signal be interpreted is the question. Because um, uh, good intentions of uh, the voters do not necessarily translate into good intentions of the very people they elect. And um, Zelensky has been uh, uh, very uh, enigmatic, as you said. And uh, we uh, actually, it was his intention, he was put in billboards. Uh, saying, and I quote, no promises. And um, uh, now I think we are witnessing the end of the transition period for him. He now feels firmly in control. He has uh, made a huge step by uh, uh, replacing his head of uh, administration. And uh, that basically means that from now on we will be receiving uh, more clear answers as to where he stands and what what, what he thinks uh, is going to be uh, the right policy for Ukraine. Um, he is uh, an interesting person because he represents a very uh, Ukrainian Soviet background. He comes from a Russian speaking background. He comes from background that feels itself very connected to this Soviet entity uh, that is culturally close between uh, um, uh, people who share the same past in Russia, in Ukraine, Belarus, elsewhere. Uh, and uh, 
the changes that happened in Ukrainian, Ukrainian, in the Ukrainian political culture uh, over the last five years, the new senses that have arrived are in uh, many cases fresh for him. But at the same time, we see that he's a fast learner. Uh, he catches concepts incredibly fast. Uh, there isn't, if I was confronted with a question, if, he, if we saw any sign of malice intention, the answer is clearly no. We've seen cases of incompetence. We haven't seen uh, cases when he willingly would cause trouble to the country that he represents. In some cases, he has surprised, actually, by being able to uh, handle difficult negotiations quite well. Uh, so I would, say, I would put it this way. I would uh, give him credit for learning fast. I would give him credit for understanding the importance of the office of the president. And uh, uh, I would uh, say that it would be easier for me to give an answer, honest answer to your question in about a year, and if that puts me in this seat a year from now, then it's a, um, and then it's a good deal. <laughs> and you mentioned here that uh, uh, his uh, chief of staff, uh, uh, Andrei Bogdan, has just been replaced by Andrei uh, Jermak, and we are now asking, what does uh, this mean? Jermak has been in charge of foreign policy, and Bogdan has been in charge of all domestic po uh, policy, both uh, economic policy, pure domestic politics, and uh, law enforcement. What do we know about uh, Jermak? Uh, what will he, uh, he change uh, in the policies that Bogdan has been in charge of? Uh, we don't know what the policy is. And, uh, it's a good question what the policy will exist, because one of the things that we have noticed from his um, uh, actions in the last year was that uh, he is the one who's uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, personalize diplomacy very much. He's the one who's trying to see what can come out of particular negotiations, what uh, um, he is uh, uh, operating within the limits and outside the limits. And uh, at the time when the society is uh, requesting the government to stay within the red lines. Uh, red lines is a very popular um, uh, set of words in, in uh, uh, probably behaved while I was given the microphone. <laughs> um, um, red lines is a popular, is a popular uh, set of two words in Ukraine right now. And um, uh, uh, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of stress among those, particularly among those who don't trust uh, uh, the current administration. Um, Zelensky has done some moves that have strategically um, um, changed the layout. For instance, the uh, prisoner exchange has uh, definitely saved a lot of people from uh, extreme uh, 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 tortures and uh, terrible life that they had in prison. Um, it's incredible that the sailors are back. It's incredible that political prisoners are back. Oleksandrov was here recently. It's it's great to have to see him free, but at the same time, understanding how the Russian legal system works, understanding that Russia will have as many uh, um, prisoners, as many hostages as it will decide that it wants to have, it's a question: What are Ukraine going to do next? You know, uh, are we strategically weakening our position for quick gains? And you know where do these quick gains lead us? Um, uh, there is uh, there is lack of policy that uh, is uh, camouflaged with uh, um, uh, assurances that everything's fine. And I think uh, the faster it becomes clear where the actual policy is, the easier it will be for everyone to build understanding. Uh, one of the things that I'm afraid uh, is intoxicating the Ukrainian political scene is that um, every uh, party, uh, every major party, including Zelensky and including uh, Poroshenko, his opponent, are still in the campaign mode. They're still running mm. a campaign. So the voters are not demobilized. And they're still trying to sting each other, uh, often forgetting that they're actually already on the same side. Uh, on the responsibility side. And um, uh, so that's 
um, uh, another transition that we will probably have to see this year, how, you know, how, how it goes. Yeah, that immediately raises two questions about on bus. Uh, you mentioned already there have been two uh, prisoner exchanges. If I've got it right, uh, uh, Zelensky has had uh, three telephone calls with uh, uh, Putin, and then they had the uh, Normandy meeting in Paris on the 9th of uh, uh, December. And uh, clearly something is going on. Both uh, uh, countries have now uh, changed, uh, or uh, rather Russia has changed the uh, person in charge of Donbass, that is uh, Dmitry Kozak rather than uh, uh, Vladislav uh, Surkov, which can only be an improvement from my point of view. And uh, fr from uh, uh, Ukraine, Andrei Yermak, who's the point man for Donbass has a stronger uh, position. Do you expect that they will really take big uh, uh, steps forward? And then the other question is uh, what you touched upon, how will that be interpreted by the people who are most suspicious about uh, Zelensky's uh, policies on Donbass? Yeah, I, <coughs> uh, I think uh, some of these, ref um, um, tactically some of these replacements and changes open some opportunities. But fundamentally, I am very critical of um, this process because there, it's a very clear problem that Ukraine has with Russia and Russia has with Ukraine. Uh, Russia wants to stay an empire. Ukraine wants to stay free. That's it. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's as simple as that. And then whatever tricks each side will be using to strengthen its position, you know, will be to the benefit or not of, of these sides. Um, uh, for... Um, Ukraine, it's a geography question. Ukraine is not a. I, Ukraine is not going to escape Russia in any way. You know, we share 2,000 kilometers of, of a common border. Uh, it's uh, by far the biggest neighbor we have, and uh, it's a question whether we're gonna be able to conduct good life as good neighbors, or we're gonna be draining resources on both sides into standing off against each other. To do that, uh, either Russia will have to change uh, internally, or Ukraine will have to basically cease to exist as an independent state. And um, uh, now, uh, I don't think that anything that Zelensky or Yermak can offer can change this paradigm. You know, it can bring us closer to victory or the loss, but it can't change the paradigm, and that's 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 the point. In that sense, let me stress another thing. From the Ukrainian perspective, probably the um, uh, uh, ousting of uh, Vladimir Putin would be uh, something that uh, could be a potential risk, because the problem is that any replacement, any feasible repla replacement for Putin is just as uh, imperialist. All major Russian political players have consensus that Crimea, occupation of Crimea is a good thing for Russia. And, you know, if this is the consensus that we're dealing with, then we, it doesn't matter, you know, what the particular agreements we have on the ground, you know, the problem will still be there. And it's not about uh, freezing or not freezing the conflict in Donbass. Donbass is only one part of the big equation. It's uh, important that we stop losing our servicemen every day. It's important that people on the line stop suffering. But then the question is, at, wh at what cost? Uh, you know, if uh, the result will be lack of hope for uh, millions <coughs> of Ukrainians who are on the occupied territories, um, uh, if the result will be, um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, threat of extinction for the Crimean Tatar identity, then that cost is unacceptable. And. Um, <coughs> I am not sure if uh, there is uh, uh, acute appreciation inside uh, the Ukrainian government of the complexity. And I'm not sure if um, the um, concepts uh, are clearly understood. But I'm sure that uh, uh, as Ukrainian history has taught us for the last 30 years, every Ukrainian president who wants to leave the office as a president has to learn it fast. Kuchma has been willing to be in, on good terms with Russia. Uh, he ended up by writing a book called Ukraine is not Russia. You know, uh, uh, same thing we can talk about, you know, Kravchuk, Yushchenko, uh, Poroshenko, you know, all of them have been 
willing in one way or the other to, to make, uh, to have workable relations. And uh, uh, it didn't work out. Um, so I think uh, uh, as much as we want this conflict to be over, um, it's going to last. Well, I'm trying to draw out the uh, logic from your position here. You say that uh, er any resolution of the Donbass conflict will not change the paradigm, while it's a major risk to any government to move uh, seriously on Donbass, which means that uh, uh, it, uh, the odds are very strongly against any resolution of the Donbass conflict. I think um, I think in some kind in some cases the Ukrainian government will have to act counterintuitive whether it wants or not. Um, economic reform is important in any case. Um, free market uh, is important in any case. Uh, uh, sustainability of democracy and decentralization is important in any case. Basically, Ukraine doesn't have a lot of room to maneuver. It has to conduct reforms, and at the same time, it has to build its own security system. Um, would that mean that, uh, for instance, the democracy will be weakening at some point? I don't know. I hope not. Um, does that mean that Ukraine will have to uh, come up with creative solutions uh, how to strengthen itself? Maybe. You know, Israel had to come up with very creative solutions. And what, what we see with the lack of support from the West, Ukraine is in many senses uh, 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 turning towards Israeli experience and try mm. to, tries to learn what is the Israeli experience about protecting itself. Um, uh, basically, it's, um, it's a challenge because Ukraine is in nation building, in uh, strengthening its identity at the same time as it has to globalize, at the same time as it has to delegate part of its so sovereignty, at the same time as it has to be very open, for instance, to um, uh, migration. One of the factors that is keeping the economy from growing is lack of people who can work. And as many Ukrainians have left uh, to work in the EU, the question is who's going to come and replace them? And, uh, and it's a good question. And it's a good question. And because, you know, every people, every, every, every group of people that moves in, um, doesn't move in only to participate in economic life. These people will be participating in cultural life. They will be, you know, local residents. They will be someone's neighbors. I'm sometimes joking that uh, probably 10 years from now, Ukrainians will know well what is the difference between Uzbek and Tajik Plov. And, uh, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and that's, uh, that's uh, a another side of this same globalization. How will it affect the um, perception of Ukrainian identity? It's a very good question. It's a very important question. Um, so, you know, um, it, I would put it this way. It's not all rosy picture, but at the same time, at every moment, uh, Ukraine has better and better and better capacity to deal with these issues. You know, uh, last year, I, uh, in the end of last year, in December, I participated in annual conference of Ukraine's think tanks. You know, um, about 10 years ago, we could say probably we could mention like 10 brands, 10 think tanks in Ukraine uh, uh, that were visible. We are now counting beyond, beyond 100, you know. And these are the think tanks that at least once a year can produce a solid paper. You know, uh, the, the institutional strengthening is enormous. Um, sometimes we don't give Ukraine enough credit because we uh, n uh, judge things at face value. I would, I, would, I would put it in a little different dimension to, so it's easier for us to understand where Ukraine stands. I'd say Ukraine was conceived in 1991. Ukraine as an independent actor was born on Maidan in, 19, in 2014. You know, for a six-year-old, Ukraine is doing pretty cool, pretty good, you know. <laughs> For a six-year-old that's conducting an independence war at the same time, uh, I'd say that the record is close to outstanding. So um, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we can't have a fatal risk anytime soon, you know, but uh, so far, so good. 
Yeah, I notice here you have uh, mentioned oligarchs only once, uh, that you are not, uh, but this initiative did not take uh, uh, money from uh, oligarchs. Uh, normally, every discussion about Ukraine is uh, almost uh, dominated by the problem of oligarchs. Uh, you don't see it as a big problem, or what should be done in order to handle uh, the problem of oligarchs? I was told uh, by Melinda that I will be stripped of microphone if I am conventional. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me give you an honest response to this. Oligarchs are a big part of um, uh, deciding power in Ukraine. They are the ones that are coming up with sophisticated uh, decisions. Uh, so they're developing solutions, they're, they're implementing these solutions, they're making they can decisions. But there are several things that we have to understand about oligarchy in Ukraine. Um, it's very different from oligarchy in uh, Russia. The oligarchs in Ukraine are not a choir. They're not singing together. I'd say it's more of a jazz. You know, if they're, sometimes they go in tune, but sometimes they fall out of tune. Uh, then every year there is more and more of them. Uh, if, um, say, 10 years ago, we could clearly say that these five people are oligarchs, you know. Then uh, there was a popular uh, um, uh, phrase about minigarchs, you know. And now I would say that <coughs> oligarchs is, is a pretty big group of people. Um, and it's more like herding the cats now, you know. It's they're, they're moving in all different directions, some uh, for the better, some for the worse. But there is uh, significant pluralism involved, which is, uh, I think, to Ukraine's benefit in the long run. Second, uh, the... <coughs> Weight of each particular oligarch falls with uh, greater uh, foreign investment, with greater number of factors coming into the markets. So they basically um, they are on the melting iceberg. Iceberg. Some of them are trying hard uh, to modernize and to keep uh, keep up with the changing time. Uh, for them, some of them it works, but for many it doesn't. Uh, third is the dem demography. Um, they, um, at least we had one case uh, with succession, and it's uh, not particularly a uh, sound case of succession. Uh, that means that um, as long as the person who uh, has become an oligarch uh, is uh, uh, alive and upbeat, you know, things are being taken care of, but uh, delegating that doesn't work. And uh, so I would, I, would, I would generally say that um, where I see the risks, I see the risk with decentralization, that um, when all of these amalgamated um, communities are finally formed, we will have particular communities where there will be tremendous lack of uh, debate and lack of uh, pluralism on a very local level. But if we're talking about national level, uh, I think the influence of the oligarchs is becoming less and less and less visible. They have played their role um, in uh, national security in 2014. Uh, they have been instrumental in uh, many cases uh, and are trying to be instrumental in many cases dealing with the government, basically saying that, okay, we'll do this, but you close eyes about this. Um, and it's becoming more and more difficult. Uh, will they have the enough power to transform into a big business? I, th I don't think so. I think uh, they will stay uh, within the framework uh, of the time when they were basically born. So um, this is a phenomenon of transition. This is a phenomenon of some bad, bad decisions that were taken in macroeconomics. Uh, of the kind of privatization we had, of the ki kind of protection of property we had. But at the same time, I wouldn't say that this is the single biggest problem that Ukraine has. Uh, it's probably not. Uh, this is in 2003. I uh, talked to a senior representative of the Industrial Union of Donbass. And he told me that Ukraine can never be a dictatorship. First of all, the East can never agree with the West. And, uh, and vice versa. And then we are four big oligarchic groups and we can never agree on anything. So therefore he thought that Ukraine was condemned to be a democracy. I, I, I would say if you're, trying to, if you're trying to understand where modern Ukraine stays, it basically 
there is a coalition uh, among the voters of Western and Central Ukraine that Ukraine should move in uh, uh, a Western direction. And uh, that coalition uh, exists since 2004. It's very solid. And uh, it's basically capable of winning any elections. Uh, now, if we want this uh, uh, to be sustainable, then the question is, are the voters of the South and the East going to join? So what's happening is there is a tr very interesting transformative process right now among the voters in the south of Ukraine. And the weight of the voters in the east of Ukraine has fallen because um, over a million people have moved to other places in Ukraine because of very low birth rate and high mortality rate. Uh, so the, it's, it's, it's a diminishing number of voters. <coughs> so um, uh, I would say that uh, from the uh, point of view of um, voters' preferences, Ukraine is very solidly on the track. Now the question is whether the democratic procedure will follow. And that's been a problem. You know, We see how difficult it is for, for the parliament to adopt a new election law how difficult it is for many uh, people in power to come to the idea that one day this may be it. Uh, I think a lot of people were frightened by uh, the victory of uh, Zelensky, Zelensky's party because uh, it literally swept ev everyone. You know, it, didn't, it didn't matter how much money you put into campaign, it didn't mm -hmm. matter how, much, how popular you were, how, how much you cared about your constituency. Um, you know, people who were wedding uh, um, uh, uh, f photographers were winning, ag winning against uh, well-established representatives of the industry in, in, in the places where, uh, if you would say before that, uh, you know, someone can be challenged, you would probably be laughed at. Uh, but, uh, but these things are happening, and I think um, that... Uh, 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 the the change of the game, the change of the rules of the game, is uh, pretty much unavoidable, making Ukraine more and more diverse, making it more and more um, uh, a place where the elites are accountable to the people who are um, making the decisions. Thank you. Let me open up to questions and uh, comments. I think I saw Alexei first here. Uh, microphone over there. I, I don't know. Alexis Savchenko, independent uh, consultant. Uh, I would like to go back to Mr. Yermak. Many people here and in Ukraine consider him one of the most ardent propo proponent of the <coughs> rapprochement with Putin. Actually, yesterday I heard that Kalamoisky's man was replaced by Putin's man. So if this is true, I hope not, but if this is true, what kind of re response would be from the Ukrainian society specifically veterans of ATO, mm -hmm. and namely since you are from Western Ukraine, namely in Western Ukraine. Thank you. It's a good question. Um, uh, I'm, as I said, I'm trying not to follow the news. Uh, so I'm trying to, to see the big picture. And uh, you outlined it, I think, in a very right way. Uh, the more there is feeling that um, uh, risky political decisions might uh, be taken, the greater there will be response from the grassroots. The response from the grassroots. And um, <clears throat> I think uh, um, many of these, uh, uh, understanding a little bit how the sociological machine works in the government in Ukraine, I would say that um, many of these issues that we hear that kind of spill out are not actually political intentions, but rather probing. You know, they're throwing in a message and then seeing what the response is. And if the response is active, they're withdrawing it. Uh, we see this with uh, the idea of um, uh, that there is a limit to harmonization of the laws with uh, uh, the EU, and the response was uh, in huge. Uh, yesterday, there was um, another idea that you know maybe the flow of water to uh, Crimea should be should be uh, considered, and the response is huge again. You know, and uh, what we see, uh, at least from the experience of the last several months, is once the response, the negative response, is very strong and uh, has broad uh, coalition behind it, then the idea is shelved, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, 
there, this is part of the accountability that I'm talking about, you know. Uh, I think uh, the government is in a position when it's trying to listen because it's not completely sure if it will have the backing from the society and it understands that it doesn't have the backing from the society. There can be different options in Ukraine what happens with the government then. Uh, and um, uh, so I, I'm, I wouldn't risk uh, claiming that I know anything more than that. We still don't know exactly who Mr. Yermak is. And uh, we still do not know exactly what kind of um, uh, positions he will be standing on. But I think uh, we're moving towards understanding these things better. And uh, pretty soon we will uh, understand better what kind of new layout we have. What should we be looking for? Yeah. The, the promises, the, 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 the attempt, the, we, we should be looking for promises that are given to the constituents. We should be looking for uh, policy proposals. We should be looking for particular moves in negotiations. I think we should generally be alert. But what you are generally saying is that uh, nothing m too much can happen on Donbass uh, or Crimea because then people will say no. I would say, I would put it, rephrase it differently. If there's a, a very strong position in the society then any Ukrainian government is weak enough to change its uh, stand. Yeah. Please I'm introduce yourself by name and uh, institution. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Uh, the Northern Ireland solution is one in which uh, you fly our flag, you use our money, we handle foreign policy, everything else is up to you. I want to look at a, for, a far future in which we are past Putin and ask whether the Northern Ireland solution could work for Donbass. And the, on an even bigger picture, can we sort of look at the reality of Crimea and say 1954 was probably a mistake, uh, Khrushchev's mistake. The place is overrun with Russians who are Russian-leaning. Uh, can we make a big deal with Russia, which is you get the hell out of Southeast Ukraine, uh, Southeast Ukraine gets the Northern Ireland solution, and you let us into the EU, and we'll look the other way on Crimea. I think the I I think that's exactly what the Russians are trying. They're trying to, to uh, what they're trying to do is they're trying to advance further. So they have something, they have some concessions that they can do, and then they would stop somewhere in the middle, by actually gaining something. The whole idea is to have a bargaining chip and turn people of Donbas into a bargaining chip about Crimea. Once we allow that, they will move further. you know. And so there's going to be no stop to that. Uh, I don't think Northern Ireland solution is something that we can use as a model, because Northern Ireland solution had a very distinctive identity issue behind it. It had a very clear religious issue behind it. We don't have such religious issue behind it um, because even if we are trying to go along with the modern sociologist flow, and I'm part of the um, uh, community that's following academic discourse and treating, for instance, communism as religion, you know, interpreting communism as religion, then I would say that uh, um, from the values survey perspective, there there is no difference between. Um, the um, composition of society on either side of the separation line in Donbass. But the outcomes will be very different. You know, now if you take a, a look at the satellite picture, you'll already see the difference in the intensity of light. You know, and, and, uh, and that's, and that's um, um, I think um, uh, probably we will not be talking about any of the existing models that we can take and adapt, probably the sophistication and the scale of this problem will be basically forcing Ukraine to, to uh, or other players involved to come up with uh, a new original solution. Um, you know, it's, it's going on, the, the, the fighting goes on, is going on much longer than it has been going on in uh, any of the conflicts uh, that we've seen, for instance, in Transnistria or, you know, or Ossetia or, you know, you name it. Uh, so we're beyond these um, uh, precedents. And uh, I, I think 
the Ukrainian-Russian conflict is already at the stage when it's a precedent by itself. Mm. Yes, please. Thank you for taking my question. Mm. Don't you think? In the name and the institution. My name is Walter Jurassic. I am a member of Polish American Congress and other political organizations. But you say something very important, security. Don't you think that security never can be accomplished without law and justice for all, like we have in the US? If we have a politicians who are easy to be bribed mm -hmm. and selling the nation left and right, the p population know. I have been in Ukraine. I have talked to the people. I watch them very carefully. They talk about nothing. The bribery and corruption, people get rich. And what in democracy is good for? Is good for the rich, not for the poor. And people still don't understand that. In order to have the, the pure democracy, United States is not democracy, it's a republic. So there's a difference. So I am so glad when I see the youth, perhaps they get the message. Go and pass the strong law against the corruption. And politicians no more will be rich. Okay. It's, uh, I think that's a very important question. Let me address it um, uh, kind of from in-depth in Ukraine. Um, the, conventional, the conventional response to an issue of corruption is um, uh, greater law enforcement, stronger judiciary, uh, unavoidability of punishment for uh, misconduct. Um, that's incredible. You know, these are textbook solutions. You know, I'm all for that. Um, uh, it won't work in Ukraine. Let me explain you why. Uh, we have a country that's within the existing living memory has had at least two generations fully formed under totalitarian rule. And this is something, you know, Western world understands pretty well how, uh, the Western world understands pretty well how uh, colonial issues work. Uh, totalitarian issues are different. They are not that, you know, the people in the West have not been exposed to them that much. So there isn't uh, basically first-hand uh, experience in, in understanding what it is. When you are in a totalitarian system, then the state has complete power over a individual. The state decides what do you do, what are you work, what your profession is, where you live, the state actually decides if you live. And if the state decides that you don't live, you have very little that you can do. Uh, in the strength <coughs> of the rules that totalitarian systems have, corruption becomes the ultimate security tool. And this is something that's very difficult to understand for many people in the West. So when you have a deeply traumatized society with totalitarian trauma, in case of Ukraine, it's also coinciding with the um, uh, trauma of um, a colonial trauma, then it means that conventional option won't work because the society is fearful of strong rules per se. Society, and, and this is exactly, if we generalize all Western uh, advice to Ukraine, it's you have to make your rules strong. Well, that's exactly something that frightens any Ukrainians because, any Ukrainian, because strong rules interpret into rules that can be unaccountable. And if they're unaccountable, nobody killed more people in Ukraine than the state in the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about tens of millions. We're not talking about, you know, a hundred people here and a hundred people there. We're talking about tens of millions of people who died. Every second male, every fourth female. You know, we're talking of enormous loss of human life that is very visible on the demographic belt if you look at it. And um, the response to corruption issues, and I agree with you completely that corruption is a terrible problem. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's a taxation of efficiency of any existing system. Governance system, econo economic system, any system. If we want uh, to fight corruption, in the case of Ukraine, we have to start with greater security of the individual. Greater security of individual 
against the rules that that individual has to live by. Uh, greater accountability, uh, greater inclusion. And this is exactly something that's not happening. Security doesn't come only from human security side. And human security, by the way, is sometimes also very difficult to explain in many Western audiences. It also comes from national security. It's the freedom from um, uh, an external attack. And security is exactly something that Ukraine doesn't have. And before we have security, it will take a lot of extra effort to gain little advance in fighting corruption. But if we do security first, then it's going to be much easier to fight corruption. Um, then there are a lot of uh, local cases that, that you can see, for instance, with, uh, you know, it's um, a bit easier in Western Ukraine, but more difficult in Eastern Ukraine because the institutional memory is different. You know, Eastern uh, Ukraine has institutional memory that comes from experience of Russian Empire and Soviet state. Western Ukraine uh, has Austrian, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Polish uh, state, and uh, uh, Soviet state. You know, uh, these are very different precedents, and they allow very different models to be taken out of this experience, out of the uh, living memory, which extends, I would say, for about 100 years. Uh, but um, in fact, I think that we need to rethink the conventional approach towards um, uh, anti-corruption in Ukraine. And I think it's important that we understand the greater complexity. Corruption, in, uh, to a great extent, is a cultural problem. And uh, it has to be dealt through the tools that are dealing with culture. Uh, totalitarian experience has been a trauma. It has never been faced. It has never been healed. One of the reasons why I'm uh, showing the churches here on the slide, because the churches, for the first time ever in Ukrainian history, modern history, have said, OK, it's a problem. We're going to try and do something about it. Uh, uh, the state is slowly recognizing this trauma as a problem. The professional um, community is slowly recognizing it as a problem. The problem uh, is the scale. The, the challenge is the scale. You know, in every society, you have people uh, uh, who have, uh, for instance, PTSD as a professional uh, uh, illness. In Ukraine, we have PTSD in the size of the entire society. When you have everyone traumatized in the society, it reaches the point when trauma is no longer visible because it doesn't stand out. Um, I'm not saying that to say that we should write off any responsibility. No, 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 no. We, we continue to, to have to live by the rules where we are completely accountable. I'm just saying that we have to be acutely aware of where we're coming from so we can address the problem in a, pro in, in, in a proper manner. Russia knows. <laughs> Russia knows that very well. Russia knows that w very well. But Russia itself, that this is also important. Russia is a unique type of empire that has colonized itself. <laughs> it has colonized not only the other states, but it has colonized itself. So Russia has the same problem. And this is exactly what my message is. If we learn how to fix this in Donbass, we will be one step closer to understanding how to fix this in other parts of the former Soviet Union. Donbass is not a uh, problem of Ukraine. Donbass is an opportunity for the entire macro region. And this is very important. Mary Kruger. Hello, Yvhen. Mm -hmm. Mary Kruger, um, State Department, retired. And that, thanks for that really interesting explanation of your viewpoint on culture. Um, I have a question about the mood and public opinion mood, whether it is changing on the longer term future of the state of Ukraine. What I have in mind is um, after 2014, people were very strongly united in feeling that Ukraine had been wronged, territory had been taken from it wrongly, and justice had to be done. Is the mood changing at all? Are people thinking, well, this is really going to be difficult to get the territory back. Maybe we should just forget about it and try to move forward. How, how are people thinking, and are there differences in sociological approaches? Thanks. Um, there's a lot of ambivalence 
there is a lot of um, difference in 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 positions. Um, what amazes me is how different this war is from other wars. You know, it's a cyber war in many uh, senses, and you don't see cyber war until your electrical grid doesn't operate anymore. You know. Um, uh, you don't feel it on kind of a daily basis. You know, you open up your whatever uh, application you're using, it, it seems to be working, and you don't know if it has a bug inside or something. Um, you know, for me, the experiences sometimes have been overwhelming. You know, I wake up at 5 o'clock a.m., I get on a fast train at 6 o'clock, it takes me to Donbass at uh, noon, I'm at, the front, uh, I'm at the front line at 1, I'm working at the front line, for instance, with the military or other people involved until four. I'm dri driven back, five o'clock again on train. Uh, at midnight, I'm at home again, you know? You can actually make a day trip from Kiev to, to the front line, you know? People on, in Donbass, half an hour driving from the front line, you know, sit in cafes under the umbrellas and, uh, you know, lead their daily lives. It's a very different war, uh, and I think it's, it's difficult in many cases to understand between shopping and taking kids to school and uh, you know doing running other errands that you are actually in a state of war at the same time. Um, and I think um, the Ukrainian society is learning how to live with it. And uh, in many cases, uh, um, uh, denial is part of coping. Uh, in many cases, acceptance is part of the uh, is part of the solution, uh, and and it's it's taken different paths with different people. Um, the Ukrainian society is composed from people of different backgrounds, and obviously there are groups inside Ukraine that are saying that you know we are we, we would still like to be with you know in one state with Russia. Uh, there are groups that are saying it's unwinnable, you know, but then um, what I would say what's important is the dynamics and if we look at the dynamics It's very clear that there are more and more self-conscious people There are more and more responsible people the size of the groups that value that treasure the Ukrainian independence and Ukrainian statehood and ability to be actors not subjects is um, stronger every day. We see record high support of Ukraine's independence. We actually see a whole new generation of people who actually understand what the um, uh, Ukrainian anthem uh, stands for. You know, and, and in that sense, I would say that there is huge qualitative change. It sometimes transforms into quality, into quantity, and so sometimes it, it, it doesn't, or at least not yet. But um, I would generally say that um, even though Ukrainians would not like to be um, playing a, a long standoff uh, against Russia, I think uh, in that sense, if need to be, then Ukrainians will pull that through. I think if anything that we've taken out of the last hundred of years is that Ukrainians are champions of survival. And uh, this is something that um, is our great asset, we know how to survive. This is something that is our curse, because knowing how to survive limits our ability to actually have a life. And, uh, and I think uh, one of the um, uh, side effects of what the Russian uh, state is doing against Ukraine is that yet another generation will live in the state of survival, in the mode of survival instead of actually being able to join the rest of the developed world and uh, contribute and uh, become part of uh, much more fun agendas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am Mark Tomnitsky. I'm a freelance writer. I've had a couple opportunities with the Atlantic Council and others. I was hoping you could touch a bit on the brain drain in Ukraine and how that will affect future democracy building. Uh, for a little bit of context, Kiev Post put out an article last month saying that about 20 years ago there was 48 and a half million people in Ukraine, and today there's 37 million. Uh, of course, that's partially because occupation of Krim and the war in Donbas. But uh, if the youth, the educated people, are supposed to be the future leaders and they're leaving for other European countries for work opportunities, what does that mean for democracy in Ukraine? Thank you. 
think that's an important question because, um, okay, let's try and uh, put it in a perspective a little bit. Um, the gr if we're talking about brain drain, the greatest brain drain in Ukraine was under Yanukovych. The number of young people, educated people who are leaving Ukraine has actually decreased. Um, but there's, it's, a, it's a, um, a moving target. We have to understand the changes that are happening. Mobility is growing. As mobility is growing, people generally move more. Um, those, I would say that, I would, I would put it this way, those, the majority of those who wanted to leave Ukraine for good have. Um, what we see right now is the so-called pendulum migration. People go to Poland or um, Czech Republic or elsewhere, work for several months, then they come back. They go, they work, then they come back. Some of them choose to stay. You know, with every iteration, there is a number of people that chooses to stay. But the majority com comes back. And um, these people who come back, come back with experience of living in a different system. They come back enriched with knowledge of how, for instance, Polish state works. You know, they come back with ideas to their, for their communities. For instance, that you know, if uh, if you have the streets lit uh, at night, you feel safer. You know, it's uh, it's that's a big step ahead. But um, then we have to understand that uh, it's not only brain drain; it's also brain gain. Uh, my friends at, uh, at the MFA are telling me that about 50,000 people from Belarus live permanently in Kyiv, and most of these people are qualified professionals. We see that uh, Ukraine becomes the place that attracts talent from, uh, for instance, southern Caucasus. Um, um, it's much, if you are in corporate business, you can make career in Kyiv branch much faster than, for instance, in many central European capitals. You know, I was um, um, just an anecdote. Uh, uh, I called an Uber one night in Kiev, and uh, I was uh, 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 I noticed that it was a very nice car with very intelligent driver who spoke many languages. <coughs> and I asked him, you know, and he had a Polish accent. And I asked him, you know, what the hell are you doing, doing driving Uber in Kiev? And he said, Well, my HR has put me here. I say, what do you mean? He says, well, I'm, I'm running, I'm a country manager for a big IT company, but I can't understand exactly how the country works. I had difficulty uh, uh, coming in. He's, he was actually, he was a person of Polish origin from Canada. And he said that he, you know, he, he had difficulty adjusting to, to the Ukrainian society. So his HR, instead of putting him through training, said, you know, if you drive Uber three hours every day, for three months, you will know that much better, you know, than anything else. You know, the thing is, you know, a Canadian, a Canadian is coming to Ukraine to make a career in Ukraine. You know, uh, so you see more and more and more of that. Ukra Ukraine's economy opens up. Uh, you know, so from that sense, I would say that there, you know, young people are leaving Britain for the United States and vice versa. Uh, and the same thing, Ukraine is part of the same process. Um, now, the question is, uh, what's going to happen uh, further? Will Ukraine be able to attract talent, for instance, from Central Asia, from Belarus, from Russia, from other countries? Um, uh, a good question will be, will Ukraine be able to retain people who went abroad and, uh, you know, came back? In uh, growing economy helps a lot, and strong grevnia helps a lot, because uh, people who are going to Poland, very often they find out that their disposable income at home was greater. So they earn more in Poland, but their disposable income, what they have in their pocket, was actually better at home. Uh, and that's also a big, a big discovery, you know. Uh, they learn that there are some things that are working much better at home. For instance, one of the things that, that is um, um, we don't uh, pull out uh, plastic uh, payment cards uh, to pay in in the stores anymore. You know, we do it contactless. And then you go to the EU and you learn that it, they still live in the 20th century. You know, with with, with regard to that, and and uh, and and you start noticing these little things that work differently. And um, um, it's a tragedy that f a lot of people actually have to. Um, uh, f 
uh, enjoy the suffering that they have to just um, uh, motivate themselves to, to, to go <coughs> elsewhere. I never heard uh, 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 people saying, I want to work to Poland because it's interesting to me for me to see what's there. Uh, people always complain, they say, oh, no, 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 we were so poor, the opportunities were so scarce that we had to, to, to do that. Uh, but uh, I think eventually uh, there will be greater appreciation of mobility, greater appreciation of freedom. Uh, Non-visa regime uh, is not connected to um, uh, uh, work migration. That's one thing that is important to understand, because these people who go to work to Poland or <laughs> Uh, Czech Republic actually go to work officially with work permits issued by these uh, uh, respective states. Uh, but non-visa regime made um, uh, foreign countries very close. You know, it's now 15 bucks and uh, uh, a passport and you're in Vienna from Kherson, you know, which is, if you drive, it's, I don't know what, 30 hours. You know, and uh, and uh, and it's very it's very close. Uh, the distances have shrunk. Mm -hmm. Now here here's the serious problem. Where the serious problem is, it's not about migration. It's about low birth rate. Uh, I'm talking to many Ukrainian security uh, experts, and what their general narrative is that there there has been many cases in world history of a country that is much smaller that has won a war over the country that was much bigger. There were many cases in world history when a country that had very little resources but knew what it was fighting for was uh, winning against a big country that had little idea of why you know, it was doing so. And that's the case with many, for instance, prisoners that Ukrainian side is uh, capturing and you know, when, when they are questioned you know, and the question is asked why the hell did you come to Donbass and what, what, you know, what have you forgotten there? And they often have difficulty rationally explaining this. And, uh, but the problem is the birth rate. And low birth rate actually, uh, it's the same problem that Ukraine has, that Russia has. And it's not only because we are part of this um, uh, urbanization process of the 20th century, and it's also because there is low security. And uh, the more you have threatening uh, factors in everyday life, uh, the more you have uh, a feeling of uncertainty, the more reluctant parents are to bring new life uh, into existence. And I think that uh, uh, a big, if this problem, if this, if this conflict will be a long one, one of the biggest tolls that it will take will not only be the people who have died on the field of battle or elsewhere, but it will also be the people who were not born because of this war. And this is something that, in my opinion, is much more serious problem than uh, people moving out of Ukraine. I wish them bad luck. Uh, I wish them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Oh, this was bad. This was bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I should not do anything like that in the Atlantic Council, especially <laughs> as we have. I wish them good luck because uh, they've been coming from the background when they were expecting bad luck. Mm -hmm. You know, the, their previous history, their parents' history was a history of, 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 of terrible events. You know, Ukrainian peasants who died of famine in the 30s have not seen it coming. You know, if you look at the classic Ukra classical Ukrainian literature, there is no death of mass famine because, you know, food becomes scarce. You know, you, 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 there is famine as such, you know, because of bad decisions, social factors, but, but not because of that. You know, terrible, terrible Second World War, Chernobyl, you know, all these things are bad luck. And I think a lot of people um, genuinely think that by moving out, they can actually kind of stop this curse. They can, they can cancel it out. Um, I hope that in many cases when they move out, they uh, get a better, clearer understanding of the um, value that Ukraine actually is giving or was giving. And I hope that a lot of these people will rejoin the society back even though from the, for instance, uh, experience of Polish migration or other nations' migration, we know that not everyone comes back. Uh, but, you know, in the modern world, 
okay, they don't come back. A lot of you guys, you know, were born in Ukraine, you stay here. It's incredible that you are here because then we can rely on you as a part of the Ukrainian global network. Incredible. I think that we can take one last, uh, two last questions. Uh, Cathy Kostman. Um, uh, qu you showed the picture of the three religious leaders. You, meant you identified the Jewish leader. I assume the other two leaders were the heads of the Ukraine, the Kiev Patriarchate and the Moscow Patriarchate. No, no? Uh, that, that's one question. And the other is, uh, I have also studied religion, and in Soviet times, uh, Ukraine had the largest number of evangelical Protestants mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union. So I'm just wondering how this all ties together. Okay. Yeah, I'll take one more question here, and then that's it. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Stacy, former State Department, uh, currently do UN work. And my question is not so much to you in the extraordinary presentation you've given us, but it's really to our audience who are Ukrainian, American, and from a number of other countries. I never thought I'd see the day, sir, when there would be skepticism about U.S. foreign policy with regard to Europe and what we used to call for at the State Department at other places in the U.S. government of, for a Europe whole and free, and why that is waning these days. If patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel, isn't populism the first refuge of a Eurasian autocrat? My friends, when our valued guest here talks about every second male and every fourth female and gives other statistics, what are we supposed to do about this <laughs> in the world we're living in today? If he's absolutely correct. Is he not? I'm asking all of you. If we sacrifice any of this, the state that he referred to responsible for most of those lo the losses of life in his country, what state do we think that is? What do we think it will do? if we give in to these principles, and maybe you'd like to answer on behalf of them. Uh, let me start yeah. with, with what you said. Uh, I just want to correct one thing. I, when I said about every second male and every fourth female, I was referring to the time of the uh, totalitar totalitarian um, uh, time frame uh, uh, of the Soviet history, because you know we, we can't expand it all the way to modern times. Of course, the figures would be different. Um, uh, now, with regard to uh, this picture, we see left to right, uh, head of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Um, uh, it's a um, uh, unity church, so it's not Roman Catholic, it's, uh, it's a Greek Catholic, so it's an Eastern, Eastern uh, right church. Uh, center is um, um, Metropolit Epiphany, he is the head of the uh, um, Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which is the church that is, as an institution, um, a new church. It has been founded from Kiev Patriarchate, from um, a Ukrainian Associated uh, uh Church, and um, uh, a few bishops uh, that joined from Moscow Patriarchate. Um, but this is the church that actually bears the tradition, uh, uh, you know, all the way from a thousand years. Um, uh, just as uh, Kiev, just as the Ukrainian Catholic Church is part of the same tradition, and uh, of course the the the, the Jewish leader and um, um, the religious landscape of Ukraine, and uh, for instance, for me who's involved in cultural studies, this is very important, is less uh, reminding of uh, the landscape of the European countries and is more American. Hmm. And um, basically what it says, it, you know, there is no one big church or one big church and there's another noticeable, sizable next to it. As in most European countries, what we have in Ukraine is we have many different denominations. You know, and in some communities, some prevail and then the others prevail in others. So there are places in Ukraine where, for instance, uh, Protestants would be the second biggest denomination. Uh, Protestants are very visible. They are very um, uh, noticeable in public discourse, in uh, religious activities, in in uh, in civil society life. Uh, Protestants are an important part of Ukrainian um, uh, religious landscape, and in that sense, uh, they're not united. They're married many different many different groups within the Protestant uh, um, uh, uh, community. But um, I think it, this picture could have been expanded. 
into a greater number of leaders. Uh, and I think the fact that um, uh, such composition exists, basically it is the, an answer to a question, uh, do Ukrainians think the same? No, they think in, they think in many different ways. You know, every religion has its own uh, social paradigm. Every religion has its own, every, any denomination has its own ways. And these ways are translated into different approaches that people take within the society. And this is basically something that the pluralism in Ukraine is uh, based on, is stands on. And so the basis for pluralism is, is, is huge. And uh, it's incredibly strong. So I think uh, religious factors are underestimated. They play differently than they usually play in Europe. Uh, they also, in, in some senses, I would say you can compare to how it works in the United States, but only to an extent. Um, but I think it has very long uh, consequences, the fact that religious um, uh, sphere is different in Ukraine than in many European countries, and this will be something that will uh, make it difficult to adjust our cultural policy and our identity policy to the one that is um, in the EU. Um, church, uh, I would say the mainstream church, has made some decisions in the EU that have led to marginalization of church in public life. Um, in Ukraine, church is trying to avoid the same mistakes, and that puts uh, us in a situation when if the church stays away from the temptation of becoming a political player, and that tempta temptation is always there, uh, then we can have a very interesting combination of um, um, uh, influence that different institutions, religious, non-religious, have in the society. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> this was a great performance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.